Thank you for coming to order. We are going to proceed with our final showcase panel of the convention. Uh, I'm Dean Reuter uh, uh, of the Federalist Society. Uh, but first, though, we're going to have uh, the drawing for the leaf of the first edition of the Federalist Papers. Uh, this is the, my final opportunity to thank the folks from the Remnant Trust uh, for the exhibit, which is still in place on the second floor in the South Carolina room. I have heard extremely positive feedback about people's experiences uh, with these documents and photographs and Twitter feeds and people holding the 1350 Magna Carta uh, and Thomas Paine's uh, first edition Common Sense and the first edition of the Federalist Papers. So take a moment and, and swing by the second floor South Carolina room if you have a chance. Uh, and I want to thank them also for the gift they gave to the Federalist Society this morning, a leaf of the first edition Federalist Papers. It will, I assure you, have pride of place uh, within the Federalist Society offices, uh, or my office. Um, <laughs> we're, we're not sure yet. Um, but now to the drawing. Uh, for this drawing, I, I want to say we carefully considered and adopted rules for the drawing in advance. We haven't changed the rules as we got closer to the drawing. We followed them carefully and diligently. Uh, they're still in place. Pursuant to the rules, those of you who entered using the QR code, uh, your digital entries have been converted and written out by hand onto individual business card sized pieces of paper. I was a little skeptical of the idea of digital voting. So we, con we converted everything to paper ballots. So now, <laughs> thank you. No commentary here, but um, now let me call up, if I could, Lisa Taylor from the Remnant Trust. These are the folks that brought these documents halfway across the country so, so you could see them and interact with them. Now, Lisa, if you could sort of stir the pot and then blindly pick a single uh, card from the, the bowl. With complete transparency here, everyone. You don't need to be present to win, and I'm confident we're going to have these results in seconds uh, <laughs> rather than days or weeks. Again, not comparing any, uh, into any system. Yeah, please. I have one in my hand. Okay, let me have it. The winner is, I should have put my glasses on. The winner is Will Trackman. I don't know if Will is here or not. It sounds like, or it looks like Will is not here. Um, so we won't need a runoff. Um, but we hope to have the results um, of the, uh, the rest of this by uh, next year's convention in case there's any dispute. We'll see if Will's in, uh, coming along. But uh, again, thanks to the Remnant Trust, the folks uh, there. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll make an actual more formal presentation of that to Will in the future. Now, I'm going to be personally disappointed in each and every one of you if you don't stop by the exhibit before uh, it begins, uh, before it ends, rather, I'm sorry. Now, here is our final showcase panel on bar associations. And that single word, associations, of course, it reminds me of a very brief story, uh, but um, I'll tell it very quickly. Now, this story also involves my wife, like my story from this morning did, uh, who is, I think, now in the room, so I'll be more delicate than I have been in the past. But Thank you, Paul. Uh, and, and just to be clear, my wife is in the room here uh, to see our moderator, Judge David Strauss, not because I'm here. She's here to see David Strauss. Um, over the years, I have always bragged to my wife, and she's conceded that children, children like me and also animals like me. Uh, they love to be associated with me, and that's the key word from associations, associate and associate. Um, we currently, at our household, we have one cat in our house, and this is the fifth cat that has lived in my house that I do not own. And importantly, I'm allergic to cats, uh, though only mildly so, and although I'm not allergic to children. Yeah. Our, our, our current cat, uh, of course, gravitates towards me because I'm allergic to it. It associates with me. See how I keep coming back to this word associate and, and, and associations. It wants to be part of my club, part of my association, on my lap, on my laptop, or my keyboard, my side of the bed. It's a source of frustration for my wife because she wants the cat to be with her always and every. But I'm powerless to do anything about that uh, other than endlessly tease my wife, it's which I recently did. I teased her, provoked her. And she said, well, I think fairly, with regard to children and animals and their unbridled love for me, 
Dean, clearly there is something about you that the unsophisticated and simple-minded find attractive. <laughs> now, I thought that was a pretty good barb until I reminded her that she married me. So, so anyhow, be careful who you associate with. Now, I I've already eaten into the panel's time. I recognize that. I'm going to be, therefore, very brief, as he asked me to be, in, in the introduction of our moderator. Uh, almost, uh, I will skip the, the, the introduction he richly deserves. David Strauss is a great man and a great a judge, a brilliant jurist with experience on the Eighth Circuit that you know about, of course, but also the Minnesota Supreme Court. He's got a long tenure in academia. If you find online, you should search for it on YouTube, a talk he has given more than once about his grandparents and the Holocaust and watch it. It is well worth the time. He is, uh, in terms of Federalist Society attendance and moderating, a repeat offender. This is his fourth, 14th consecutive uh, National Lawyers Convention, and he's also a good personal friend um, and beloved by my wife. So with that, David Strauss. All right, so thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dean. It is indeed my uh, 14th straight year being here, and the thing that keeps me coming back is the great discussion and the great people. So thanks for sticking around on a Saturday afternoon when you certainly could be somewhere else to hear about bar associations. I actually think that the entire week has been leading up to this panel. Um, at least that's what I've told my, uh, my panelists. Um, so... One of the things that Dean mentioned is I spent, I spent seven and a half years on the state Supreme Court in Minnesota. And so um, particularly when you're on a state Supreme Court, you spend a lot of time dealing with bar associations, much more, frankly, than you do as a federal judge. Um, and so not only do I have that experience, but I also have the wonderful experience, and Judge Bay and I were just talking about this, of going through the um, ABA's rating system for, uh, for judicial nominees. So I've seen it from, from all different, uh, different um, angles. Um, I want to briefly talk about the two um, types of or categories of bar associations and then tell you why I think this panel is extremely important. So in a majority of states, a slight majority, um, integrated bars are the norm. And the integrated bars have broad regulatory authority that's usually given by either statute or court rule. That's the most common way. Their powers are vast. Disciplinary authority over lawyers, seeking funding for the profession, uh, including for uh, public defense and legal aid, um, and in some states, selecting judges. The first integrated bar was established in 1921 uh, in a state in my circuit, North Dakota. The number has steadily increased since then, and bars are taking up more and more uh, air in sort of the legal community. Um, then there is what are called voluntary bar associations. The most prominent example is the American Bar Association, which we're all familiar with. And some states, like Minnesota, my home state, have a voluntary bar association as well. Now, in Minnesota and these other states, uh, the Supreme Court keeps a few more of the powers that go to integrated bars. And the most prominent example is the discipline of lawyers. Um, in my case, I spent two or three years overseeing uh, the Office of Lawyers' Professional Responsibility in Minnesota, which is a board that was set up to deal with ethical violations by lawyers. In Minnesota, in Minnesota as well, uh, practice groups within the bar regularly filed briefs in the state Supreme Court. And I think the construction law section of the Minnesota Bar Association was perhaps the most frequent offender of, of, of amicus briefs in that, in that way. So here's what we know. No matter the type, bar associations play a pivotal role in the legal profession, and yes, even in American life. The question is, and the question I hope we answer, is should they? They rate and pick our judges, they litigate in court, they adopt resolutions that take positions on behalf of their members, they accredit law, accredit law schools, and they even occasionally lobby the political branches of government. <laughs> so we are here to discuss whether they go too far, and if so, whether we ought to think about scaling them back. To talk about these issues and more, we have a great panel assembled. Um, 
to my immediate left, we have Daniel Thies, uh, who's a shareholder in the Weber and Thies PC. Um, he clerked for Judge, Judge James Holderman on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois and Judge Jerry Smith on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He serves on the Executive Committee of the Council of the American Bar Association, Section of Le Legal Education, and Admissions to the Bar. He was also the reporter for the 2009-2010 ABA Presidential Commission on the Impact of the Economic Crisis on the Profession and Legal Needs. And without further ado, I will let uh, Mr. Thies talk. So good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Um, and if you'll, as you hear the introductions of the uh, rest of our panel members, you may no notice a slight uh, difference in the pro professional trajectories that we have followed. Um, I consider myself a Main Street lawyer in a small firm uh, in Champaign. And it's an honor as a Main Street lawyer to uh, be on a panel with a former Solicitor General of the United States who's extremely distinguished and somebody I've admired for a long time and also two distinguished academics. Um, and I think it's really the Federalist Society at its best when it invites people from different backgrounds to debate. So why is that relevant? Well, m my experience with bar associations is really the experience of the small town Main Street lawyer, uh, where bar associations really play a more critical role in the day-to-day -day practice. Um, everything from access to malpractice insurance to CLE to lawyer assistance programs to ethics hotlines, uh, mentoring, networking, um, and even uh, support with lawyer trust accounts. These are all things that come up in the day-to-day -day practice when you're in a small firm where you need to rely on a larger association. Maybe not as important if you're a government lawyer or you're at a large firm. Um, so that's the perspective I come from. Uh, and as we dive into the topic of the regulatory power bar associations, I think it's uh, necessary to first answer two questions that I'm going to, to try to address in my remarks. First, uh, what is the nature of that power? And second, why do bar associations have it in the first place? So let's start with the nature of that power. <clears throat> so for the most part, and with, with a couple of exceptions that Judge Strauss has noted, it's not really regulatory power at all. Uh, in fact, the power of bar associations is persuasive. Uh, and the ABA's accreditation power is a good example of this. <clears throat> the reason why uh, the uh, list of accredited law schools from the ABA matters is because state supreme courts in every state have decided that in order to sit for the bar, uh, it, you are allowed to sit for the bar if you have graduated from an ABA accredited law school. State supreme courts could choose to change this rule tomorrow and the ABA would be powerless to, to stop it. So the government regulatory power that is really in operation there is the decision of the state supreme courts, not of the ABA. Uh, and I note actually that that power is not absolute. So the, the most prominent uh, example is of course the California uh, 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 system where there are state accredited law schools that the ABA has nothing to say about. Uh, and the graduates of those schools can also sit for the bar. Um, so the ABA uh, is not itself exercising actual regulatory power. The same thing is true of the ABA model rules of professional conduct. Of course, state supreme courts decide whether or not to adopt those uh, and whether there should be any adjustments to the model rules before they are adopted. Uh, a good example of this is the recent controversy over Rule 8.4, uh, which the model rules were expanded a few years ago by the ABA in order to try to, to say that it would be professional misconduct if a lawyer engages in discriminatory or harassing conduct. Uh, there's a lot of concern about that rule uh, and the thought that uh, it's going to actually regulate the private conduct of lawyers. Uh, that indeed was a concern of the Illinois State Bar Association when that model rule came out. I participated in some of the debates there. Uh, and we ended up, uh, I would modifying the ABA proposal quite a bit before recommending a change to our state Supreme Court. As of today, the state Supreme Court has not adopted the change to the ABA model rules in 8.4 which is a good example of, again, how the ABA does not have power to dictate what it wants from a regulatory perspective. Now, uh, Judge Strauss mentioned Bar Association's role in lawyer discipline, which might be that partial exception I mentioned. In mandatory or integrated bar states, the state bar often does have a direct role in either bringing or adjudicating complaints of misconduct. Even then, though, the state bar decisions are subject to review and reversal by, again, the state Supreme Courts. Uh, and of course, that sort of direct regulatory power is not present in voluntary bar states like my state of Illinois. Um, as these examples illustrate, the regulatory power of bar associations, such as it is, is closely associated with the power of the state Supreme Courts. In most cases, it's either directly delegated by those courts or it's effective only to the extent that the bar association is able to persuade the state Supreme Court. Uh, and this leads me to my second question, uh, which is why bar associations have this power. In a nutshell, 
It is crucial to the preservation of an independent judiciary that is capable of checking the power of the political branches. Without this check, the political branches would be able to close off access to the courts. Uh, and with it, you would lose the independent judiciary. In other words, no independent judiciary can really be independent unless access to the courts through trained, competent counsel uh, is also independent of interference by the political branches. And perhaps the best way to see the importance of this principle is to look around the world uh, to one other example of a jurisdiction that has inherited uh, a legal tradition similar to our own, uh, and I'm speaking of Hong Kong, which of course comes out of its British colonial past. Um, because of that common background, the Hong Kong Bar Association has a role in approving new lawyers to join the bar, uh, just as bar associations do here in the United States. They also discipline existing lawyers, and they, actually they also recommend judges for appointment in the Hong Kong system. Um, now, of course, if you've been following the news, you know that the Chinese Communist Party has been cracking down on freedoms in Hong Kong and that they are trying to limit the extent to which there's a free Republican government there. Um, on the mainland, uh, in fact, lawyers are often disbarred or jailed if they challenge the power of the Communist Party. Uh, this has not been true in Hong Kong until recently when the national security law was passed in 2020. And the government has used that law in order to prosecute numerous democracy and rule of law activists. Uh, for a crime when they oppose the politics of the communist government in Beijing. And what's interesting about this, this case study is that one of the areas that the communist government has targeted is the authority of the Bar Association, which they are seeking to limit. Most recently, the communist government has tried to limit the role of the Bar Association in the appointment of lawyers to the rank of senior counsel, uh, which is the highest rank of the, the Hong Kong bar, bar, equivalent to a Queen's Council or King's Council now in Britain. Um, uh, and in fact, they have also tried to prevent the Bar Association from disciplining prosecutors who go too far and break ethics rules when they're trying to enforce the national security law. So I think what we can take from this is the lesson that it is key for a tyrannical regime to be able to control the prosecutors and the lawyers who oppose their power. Um, and in fact, this has become such an important crusade for the Communist Party that the, the uh, former head of the Hong Kong Bar Association was forced to flee recently in March after being questioned by the police. So this example shows that bar association involvement in the licensing of lawyers and the other regulatory power of bar associations is actually an important obstacle to tyranny and one that would be tyrants around the world are seeking to remove. Um, now I should clarify, um, that this role for bar associations was not always as prominent a part of the separation of powers in the United States. Uh, and that makes sense because modern bar associations did not exist at the time of the founding. Uh, now to be sure, the role of the bar in regulating itself can be traced back uh, quite a distance to the medieval ends of court in England. Uh, and in fact, bar associations did play a role, for example, in Massachusetts, uh, which in 1810 gave county bar associations control over who could practice law in the state's courts. So there are precedents uh, in our legal tradition for the role of bar associations. However, the sort of modern regulatory regime that we've had described today really did not come about uh, until the Progressive Era and then the New Deal Era, when there were a series of court decisions and legislative acts uh, that tended to rely on the rationale that I have laid out today, the separation of powers, as a reason for giving bar associations authority under the supervision of state Supreme Courts to regulate the profession. Uh, and if you're interested, there's an 1899 Illinois Supreme Court decision called N. Ray Day, which is one of the earliest articulations of this rationale. Now, I don't have time to give a complete history of the rise of the regulatory power of bar associations, but I would like to observe that the rise of that power roughly corresponds with the rise of the regulatory state in the Progressive Era and the New Deal Era. Uh, and as the political branches accrued more regulatory power during those periods over different areas of society and the economy, Prominent attorneys and judges recognize the importance of preventing them from exercising the same kind of regulatory power over the class of people that was most responsible for safeguarding the rights of the people against that regulatory power. Hence, the power of the bar associations grew as a counterweight to the administrative state. Uh, and one figure I would point to is, is Elihu Root, the uh, former Secretary of State and Secretary of War, who became president of the ABA in 1916 and is responsible for implementing uh, much of the modern regulatory regime and the power of bar associations as we know, know it today. Now, if it, this had not happened in our history, imagine the alternative. Today, 
we might have a Bureau of Lawyer Regulation as a division of the US Department of Commerce or maybe the Justice Department that would be responsible for the licensing and disciplining of lawyers. And of course, this would be a bureaucracy with all the faults that are typical of any other, bloated, inefficient, and subject to interference from the political branches. I have a hard time seeing how this would be an improvement over the current system with the regulatory power of bar associations. So in closing, I'd like to remind you of two comments by two shrewd observers of American democracy and the legal profession. Uh, the first is Alexander Hamilton and his observation in Federalist 35 that the learned professions, including lawyers, would have to pay, play a crucial role in the new republic, mediating between the various economic interests that otherwise would tear the nation apart. The second is Tocqueville's observation in 1835 that lawyers are the aristocracy of America as a result of the role that they play tempering the excesses of the democratic element of society. To realize these visions of Hamilton and Tocqueville, to be successful at mediating the conflicts of society and tempering the excesses of democracy, lawyers cannot be subject to being co-opted and controlled by those popular interests that they're supposed to mediate. Uh, instead, we must defend the proud tradition of lawyer self-regulation, which in the last analysis is vital to the self-government of a free and independent people. Thank you. All right, thank you for setting the stage. Um, now, uh, to my immediate right uh, is Mr. Bill Adams, um, who's the Managing Director of the Section of Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar at the American Bar Association. He has 25 years of legal education experience, having served as Dean, Associate Dean, and as a Professor of Law. He also serves as an officer in several bar associations, including as chair of the Florida Bar Public Interest Law Section and the Florida Bar Committee on the Elderly. And I'm anxious to hear what he has to say about the ABA in particular. All right, thank you. Um, and, and thanks to the society for inviting me. Like <clears throat> Daniel, I feel honored to be with the speakers, particularly the gentleman to my right. And I promise to stay respectful even when they tell me what a poor job we're doing of accrediting law schools, because that's my job. <laughs> no one likes the, the, the job that we're doing, and everyone always has suggestions, and I'm open to hearing them. So I, I almost feel like I should apologize <clears throat> for accepting this invitation, because I, I work for the Council of the Section of Legal Education Admissions to the Bar, not the Bar Association per se. Um, but I, it does give me an opportunity to, to try, which, which is a difficult task for me, to explain that because I understand why people are confused about the ABA's role because we call schools ABA approved. And it's just a shorthand, lazy way because saying that you're a council of the section of the legal education admissions to the bar approved school is like too long for most people to remember. So I will say that it, when, I, when I pointed out that we do keep a fairly strict wall between the council and the rest of the professional association, and to the extent that my presence here is relevant to this topic, I agree that keeping the accrediting body separate from the Bar Association is a good thing. Um, and so we have been the accreditor of the first professional degree in the United States by the Department of Education since 1952. That separate and independent status is a requirement by the United States Department of Education that if an accrediting agency is within a professional association, it must operate separately and independent from the professional association of which it is a part. And practically, what does that mean? That means that the governing bodies of the ABA, the executive director of the ABA, have no role in the findings of noncompliance have no role in the imp imposition of sanctions or the approval of law schools. It, <clears throat> and, and also, it has a limited role in the approval of our standards and rules of procedure, however, which I'll explain. That role is when the council decides to create a new standard or rule or amend a standard or rule, it has to submit it to the House of Del and the American Bar Association House of Delegates. The House of Delegates has the opportunity to concur in the change 
And if it does, it becomes immediately effective. If it chooses not to concur, it can send it back to the council for the council to um, reconsider. Um, that role is supposed to represent some, some opinion from the profession about whether the council is doing something that is good or bad for the profession. The council then can choose to give up, it can choose to revise the proposal, or it can send it back to the, to the House for a second time. If the House receiving it a second time, once again, if it concurs, it becomes effective. If it chooses not to concur and send it back to the council, that's the end of its role. It cannot veto or stop the council from going forward with a standard or rule that it passes. So on the second referral back, once again, the council has to decide, okay, the, maybe the profession doesn't like what we're doing. Um, should we give up? Should we try to do it differently? Or should we just go forward because on this issue we think we're doing the right thing? So what, that hasn't happened very often. Uh, if anyone's interested, it did happen with, with the council when it toughened our bar passage standard. The House twice refused to concur and the council went ahead and we amended the, the bar pass standard to make it more rigorous than it was at the time. <clears throat> I'll also say that um, that the board and the uh, and the executive director and the pre ABA presidents really do honor that wall. So they don't speak on our behalf, and I don't speak on their behalf. So I did say to to the group, if you ask me questions about the ABA's judicial qualification process or its passing policies, I can't speak to that. Uh, they respect our our. Uh, um, this, um, role and they don't speak on our behalf and, and I don't, I'm there as well. And it's just as, it's just as well, I don't interact with the other parts of the ABA that much, I am really working with the accrediting body. So when, when um, I heard that one of the topics was gonna be on the judicial qualification process of the ABA, I thought I've worked there for eight years, I've never met her, let alone worked with them I, I don't know sort of how they operate other than what it says on their website. So with those apologies, I'll also, I also will talk a little bit about what, I, what are the um, express formal restrictions on our powers, sort of indirect restrictions on our powers. And if people are interested later, I'll talk a lot about the practical limitations on what, they, what the council is able to do. So, uh, Daniel has, has expressed what is, I think, the most important limit on our power, and that is, I mean, the Department of Education approval of us as, a, as the accrediting agency is important, um, but as a practical matter, for law students to receive federal student loans, they could do so without our approval because they belong to universities that have regional accreditor approval. The only schools that will be impacted if we, for some reason, decided to not be the USDE approved accreditor anymore would be for the independent law schools, and even they could seek approval from um, regional accreditors if we should ever, if we would ever decide to do that, which I don't think we ever will. Um, the other limit, as I said, we're the accreditor of the first professional degree. And what that means and what a lot of people don't understand is we're only the approver of the JD. Those LLMs and the growing body of master's degrees, we have no authority over them. We don't approve them. The only role we have with them is they have to ask the council to acquiesce in their offering it. And the acquiescence goes to, is it going to interfere with the JD program? If the council thought the LLM or master's degree if we had questions about the quality or whatever, we have no authority to say anything about that. All we can say is you can operate it because it doesn't interfere with the JD. Uh, also, just who is the council since I've been talking about them? Um, it consists of 21 members. By USDE regulations, no more than 10 of them can be law school academics. 
Three of them have to be public members, which are generally um, people who aren't lawyers or married to lawyers. My predecessor used to joke if law schools were doing their job, no one would qualify as a public member. Um, but uh, so currently we have uh, a couple of people with accreditation experience, one who was on the accrediting body for architecture and another one who was the chair of one of the regional accreditors. Um, as I said, the board, the president of the ABA has no role in selecting those members. They're elected by the section pursuant to the slate offered to the section by the nominating committee. In all honesty and transparency, the section usually accepts the slate nominated by the nominating committee, but it has the procedural right to offer competing a competing slate or competing candidates if it wants. So um, who are the 11 bes besides the law school academics? Who are the eight people who aren't public members? They tend to be state Supreme Court justices, lawyers, university administrators, and, and um, other, like I say, other public members. So f I'll close with saying, to the extent you're wondering uh, about how if you have any interest, it's because you have a objection to what we do or you're interested in what we do. Um, since I've been a managing director, which has only been two and a half years, um, I have tried to um, have us have more round tables where we invite people from a variety of perspectives to give us input on what they think we should be doing with our standards. One of my ongoing issues that I always have, and most groups who ask me to talk to them are, are uh, law school groups. And so they frequently will tell me, well, we all think your, this standard should be X or Y. And I say, that's nice. You're who we regulate. We're the regulator. That's called regulatory capture. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, unfortunately, just the way the, the system works, they tend to have more access to us. They talk to us. They're the ones who call me all the time complaining about we, you know, we, we regulate them too much, et cetera. So I think, and as I express to them often, I think we should have more input from people in the profession. I understand the House of Delegates process is maybe not the ideal way for us to get all of the input from the profession that we need. So I, I uh, invite people to, uh, who are interested to participate in our roundtables. We recently had one on academic freedom where I tried to, we, we did invite people from across the ideological pers uh, perspective, including you know, First Amendment advocates. We had a representative from Fryer. Finally, <clears throat> because I do get asked, like, how does someone get selected for the council? As I said, there's a nominating committee. Um, what they generally will look at is, do you have accreditation experience in general? Do you have legal education experience or experience with our processes? So for lawyers who are interested, I tell them the easiest way to get involved is to volunteer to be on one of our, on a, one of our site visit teams that visit schools when they're up for reapproval. It is difficult for me to keep, we, we have a lawyer on every site visiting team. Uh, and I'll be honest and transparent with you, we have a hard time keeping the lawyers because it's a lot of work. It's, it's two and a half days and it's a lot of work. But as long as you're willing to do the work and you'll follow our rules, which are pretty simple, which is just report the facts, don't make conclusions, don't tell the school that that's not the way your school did it when you were there and they should do it a different way, then we're glad to have you do that. You can contact our office and we'll do that for you. And with that, I will close. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, uh, the person on my far right really needs no introduction. He's been coming to Federalist Society events for far longer than my 14 years. Um, he is a former Solicitor General of the United States from 2001 to 2004. Uh, he was in, the, in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel from 1981 to 1984, and he has argued 65 cases before the United States Supreme Court, including some uh, we may be familiar with 
Bush versus Gore, Citizens United, and Hollingsworth versus Perry. Um, so I will turn it over to the esteemed Ted Olson. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to make a few general remarks um, and then uh, just a couple of comments on what we've heard so far this afternoon. I have been a, when Gene Meyer called me about this program, I thought this is a terrific idea. This is something that I have not seen explored, except individually in essays and, and that sort of thing. But this is a very significant thing for lawyers. And because there is regulation, whether it is acknowledged or sub rosa or implicit or by, by pressure and so forth, there is regulation of lawyers, there's regulation of, of practices, there is regulation of the agencies that create lawyers, the law schools, there is regulation of the requirements through bar associations, not necessarily the ABA. There are regulations of what courses you can take, of what um, CLE courses you must take, whether it's in your field or not. So there is a substantial segment of regulation of lawyers and therefore law and therefore society uh, through bar associations. So that's an important subject. Is it done the way it should be? Is it should be changed? Um, and I will say that I have, I started as a member of the ABA in 1966. Uh, and I was a member of the ABA until about five or six years ago when I was discouraged by some of the policies and positions that the ABA was taking. Now I sent, spent many years as a member of the administrative law section. I was a member of the House of Delegates. Uh, I was at uh, various roles with the ABA. I think it's a wonderful organization for lawyers to the extent that they can associate with one another, learn things about their practice, whether it's libel or whether it's mechanics liens or, or trusts and estates, whatever it is, it's a fine organization, but it is a political organization that takes political positions. Its House of Delegates takes very, very strong uh, and firm policy positions on many, very controversial issues that have nothing to do with the practice of law I submit, such as abortion, um, uh, death penalty, and things like that, for which many citizens feel that they know every bit as much as lawyers do about whether or not that is a good thing or that is not a good thing. At any rate, I have been a member and I have respected the ABA and its leadership I am also a member of an integrated bar, the California Bar Association. That also started in 1966. Um, and and I, I have been a subject of that regulation, including these hideous CLE requirements that I have to do every year. Even though I've been practicing law for something over 50 years, I have to take courses and things I have nothing to do with. And, and despite the fact that I have argued 65 cases in the United States Supreme Court, I still must take these uh, sponsored programs that private institutions get lots of money requiring us to take. At any rate, that's a little bit of background. Um, and also, what, what I think that we've, we've heard so far today, and you'll hear from me, is that the issue of perception. How much regulation is there? Who's doing it? How is it being done? And is it the way that we want uh, our society to be regulated in this country? And I was thinking about this last night Many of you were there uh, in the room when um, uh, Professor Epstein uh, gave his Barbara Olson lecture, which I thought was, a, again, every time you hear from him, it's a piece of brilliance. And the only problem I have with him is that he's so smart and he's so fast that I can't keep up with him. And I want, <laughs> I want a transcript so I can back, go back and read what he says. But I thought was his lecture was somewhat appropriate to the subject that we're talking about today. Uh, he spoke of uh, substantive and procedural due process in the government of our affairs. He covered separation of powers, an independent and stable judiciary, non-delegation of legislative authority to quasi-government or private entities, properly administered uh, appointments of officers who execute government authority, uh, and, it, and, and, and not allowing individuals to be judges in their own cases and precluding interested parties from governing affairs in which they have interests 
uh, biases or conflicts. Now, those things that he was describing as antithetical to what he perceived, and I agree with him, as good government, as good constitutional government, as good the way to administer our legal affairs, is a description in many respects of the administration of the legal profession by the uh, bar associations. Now, I may not be doing this completely fairly. I'm generalizing a bit, and I may not capture ever the spirit of everything that he said, but it resonated me when I was thinking about what I was going to say today and what I've been thinking about. Um, substantial swaths of our culture, laws, and society are being determined by non-government bar associations with sliding, expanding, changing governing authorities, self-appointed, and self-perpetuating to a large degree with pronounced interest in the matters they are governing, policy pre preferences and positions um, uh, are, are articulated um, and which we have for, by individuals for whom we have not voted uh, and are being put into law by those relatively anonymous non-government authorities um, at, at a vast, re man, vast number of which have advanced and powerful liberal biases. A very powerful, influential system, indeed, very, very powerful. Now, I, I was going to do something like this. Um, I'm not questioning the integrity or the, the uh, decency of the people that run these programs at the bar associations or at the ABA. I know them. They are fine people. They believe that they are doing the right thing and that they are doing good. What I'm criticizing is the system by which we put those individuals, however well-intentioned, in place. Now this is, I was gonna do this, um, I was gonna ask people to raise hands, but I'm not going to do this. This is a sort of an optional, non-participatory poll. You don't have to respond to these questions. But how many of you know the leaders of your uh, local bar association? The leaders of the ABA? How many of you participated in selecting these individuals, determining their qualifications? Do you know how the ABA selects its House of Delegates? By the way, the House of Delegates selection process to which you alluded is the most Byzantine system of government that any group of people could devise. In fact, I think you could only devise it by coming up with something, amending it, changing it, adopting a particular pre preference group's position in terms of the House of Delegates. The litigation section has one delegate for every X thousand members. The probate section has one delegate for a couple of hundred members. The Asian and South Pacific Bar Association has one delegate for, I don't know, half a dozen members. I, I'm exaggerating, these are not facts, but there is a disproportionate means by which the House of Delegates works and the way it operates, and you have to be a part of the ABA in these sections for years and years and years to be involved. Do you know how the ABA selects the House of Delegates? That question I just sort of answered. I, I doubt that you do. It's Board of Governors, it's select committees, it's panels, it's briefs. Do you know how the Law School Accreditation Committee is selected? Who are its members? What standards, goals, policies they apply? Have you read the standards and rules? I just heard that the it's very simple. There's just uh, some, some rules that uh, all you have to do is pick up this thing and you'll know exactly how it works. Well, here it is. Um, I had a, uh, made an effort to get it. It's uh, 200 pages of, of print that a person my age cannot yet read. <laughs> it, is, it is complicated. I'm not saying it's unfair and I'm not saying it's unjust, but it is complicated and it's um, accreted various different interpretations over the years. Now, bar associations uh, are trade unions. Uh, what happened when we turned over our public schools to teachers unions? Is government service a good thing to turn over to public employees unions? Are public pension and retirement programs the things that we should turn over to the employees and beneficiaries of those programs? Should prison unions or custodial people be in charge of the rules and standards by which prisons are operated? 
Uh, should federal service to uh, federal service employees be governed by their own standards and rules with respect to conduct, appraisal, removal? As a as a as a person who practiced and worked in the United States government for years, let me tell you those are equally Byzantine, and basically they are the product of the association, the union, uh, the trade association that's produced them. Now this is public government. Why do we delegate? government of public services to private self-interested associations whose leaders have conflicts and biases. They have their, their natural instincts and they believe in the rightness of those things, but those are their instincts. If you read the resolutions every year by the House of Delegates, and if you compile those over the last 20 years, and that's a big stack of things because they hardly ever get changed, a, a, a resolution passed in 1956, and I'm making this up, but uh, resolution passed in 1956 is still there and still funded by the lobbying by the ABA with respect to, in Congress with respect to those things. Uh, these associations are frequently dominated by liberal uh, activists using public pu public money uh, or coerced private funds in the in the integrated bar situation to advance liberal policies, objectives, and causes. Now the Supreme Court ra has ratcheted that, that back a little bit in a couple of cases, but it isn't finished the job yet. Now, a wide range of these public policies are established, detect, uh, dictated, and enforced by these groups. And I include just a, a few things, the bar, bar membership criteria, standards, CLE requirements, um, accreditation positions, and we'll talk maybe more about accreditation, what the ABA standard requires with respect to a law school being accredited. And the, the impact, it's not, it's not just a nice thing to do. The Department of Education gives the authority to the American Bar Association to accredit law schools. That has to do with the availability of public funds, in some cases the ability to take the, the law exam to practice law, and so forth. The other things that the bar associations deal with in terms of courses that they require have to do with substance abuse, bias discrimination, workplace uh, um, harassment, diversity, equity, inclusion, and the whole line of things. Now, I heard that it isn't really that much. There isn't really that much regulation by the ABA or the bar associations. Well, a lot of it is perception, and a lot of it is uh, moral suasion, and the uh, ability to adopt a standard or require a standard or impose a standard that people feel is the law. Uh, and law schools have to deal with this, and law associations have to deal with it. Bar associations and individuals have to deal with it. The idea that the accreditation committee, the council, um, is, is independent of the ABA, it strikes me as not credible. It's an agency of the ABA. It's a part of a section of the ABA. Its leadership is developed according to ABA policies. Uh, and as Bill was saying, well, you have to, they have to submit their resolutions to the House of Delegates, which is another crazy operation, which is very much like what the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate does to the District of Columbia. District of Columbia passes laws thinking that they are independent and then the Congress can veto them or set them aside and so forth. I won't go on, I probably exceeded my authority, but I wanted to frame this as an issue of public governance, standards by which uh, we are affected, uh, the legal profession of all places uh, is affected in a very, very significant way because we lawyers appear in court, we lawyers are uh, perceived as authorities in the law and we are being governed by these standards, by these associations, which are not a part of government agencies. They are delegated uh, by legislatures or courts to do the work. And then, then those, the, the legislature or the courts then can say, we didn't do it, they did. All right, thank you, Ted. So I have to be a little honest. When we were on our uh, on our Zoom call the other day, I was a little worried that we might not have enough disagreement among members of the panel. I think we're there, and I'm happy that uh, that Ted was willing to uh, 
uh, to take on uh, some of the things that were said by our previous two speakers. So I think after our next speaker goes, I think we're going to have a very robust debate among panelists. And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, our last speaker has been um, a friend of mine for almost 25 years, um, Professor Brian Fitzpatrick. Um, he is a law professor, teaches constitutional law, uh, class actions, federal courts at Vanderbilt Law School. Um, he clerked on the United States Court of Appeals uh, for the Ninth Circuit for Judge O'Scanlan and Justice Antonin Scalia of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, he then spent some time at a law firm I spent some time at, Sidley and Austin, and served as special counsel for Supreme Court nominations to Senator John Cornyn. Um, he has some very, I think, strong words uh, about bar asso associations that I think you will find interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to uh, serve with you again. And I do think that I can pick up right where General Olson left off. Um, I think I can summarize my views in two sentences. Uh, number one, lawyers are not ideologically representative of the rest of the American people. And number two, it is a bad idea to delegate the government's power, as bloated and inefficient as the government may be, it is a bad idea to delegate its power to groups of people that are not ideologically representative of the American public. And that is exactly what we do every single day when we give the bar special power over how we select judges and special power over the regulation and accreditation of our law schools. Let me just begin with the evidence of how politically unrepresentative, ideologically unrepresentative the bar is in our society. There's a wonderful journal article by two political scientists, Adam Bonica and Maya Sin. The article is called The Politics of the Bench and the Bar. It's from 2017, the Journal of Law and Economics. And what they did is they took the 2012 Martindale-Hubble database of lawyers and they combined it with databases about campaign contributions that people with the same names as those lawyers donated to political candidates. And they've graphed out just how liberal the legal profession is. You can actually go to their paper and see the distribution of campaign contributions of lawyers in every single state. You can see the distribution of campaign contributions for alumni of every single law school. They break down the legal profession by sub-practices, government lawyers, corporate lawyers, law professors. You can see the distribution of campaign contributions for every single sub-practice. And the general takeaway <laughs> is that lawyers are very liberal people. Uh, they are not like the rest of the American public. And so, for example, in 2012 anyway, they found that the median lawyer is about as liberal as Andrew Cuomo or Bill Clinton. Now, you know, maybe by today's standards of Democrats, that doesn't sound very bad. Uh, but <laughs> who knows what the data would show circa 2022, but it's still to the left of the American people. And so when we talk about the bar associations, these are the people we're talking about. We're talking about people that we know are to the left of the American public. According to Bonica and Sin's data, attorneys in every single state but four are more liberal than the politicians in their states. The only four states where the politicians are as liberal as the lawyers are Connecticut, Rhode Island, Hawaii, and Massachusetts. In every other state, lawyers are to the left of the people that are being elected by the public. So when we talk, for example, about these integrated bar associations, these are the people we're talking about. In every state except for the integrated bar is going to be to the left of the people selected by the electorate in those states. Now, Bonica and Sin didn't study these voluntary bar associations where you have to choose and pay dues to be part of the bar. But you know, my impression of voluntary bar associations, I think this is certainly true of the American Bar Association, is they're probably even more to the left of the unified bar associations because 
the voluntary bar associations like the American Bar Association has driven out conservatives like General Olson because they are so far to the left. We don't want to give money to them anymore. Uh, we only give money to the bar when we're forced to as part of one of these integrated or unified bar associations. And of course, Bonica and Sin also did not study the council of a voluntary bar association like the one that accredits, the, that accredits law schools. But again, I'd be stunned if the council of the American Bar Association that does the accreditation is not also quite far to the left of the rest of the American public. So, as far as I can tell, the data all points in one direction. Lawyers are more liberal than the rest of the public. And then we have to ask ourselves whether it's a good idea to give groups like that uh, special power delegated from the government that controls very important things in our lives. So let's talk about judicial selection. In many states, they have something called merit selection. What merit selection does is it uses a commission, a small commission, to limit the candidates the governor can pick from to put, uh, to, to replace um, a judge on the bench. So in, in most of these merit states, there's a commission that gets together, vets candidates, and send th sends three names to the governor. And when there's a vacancy, the governor has to pick one of those names. So in many of these merit states, Who's on the commission? The commission has special seats reserved for lawyers, for members of the bar. I wrote an article in 2009 in the Missouri Law Review, it's called The Politics of Merit Selection, where I go through every single one of these merit states, how many people are on the commission and how many of those spots are reserved for the bar. Um, well, what happens when you have a commission with spots reserve for one group of people that we know is to the left of the public, well, you end up with judges to the left of the public. And so I wrote another article in 2017 in the Vanderbilt Law Review. Bonica and Sin have examined the same question with their data, and they've concluded that judges in merit selection states are more liberal than the public in those states, and they're more liberal than judges in states that have other selection methods, such as the federal method or judicial um, elections, partisan judicial elections. And so what this means is, you know, one third of our government, the judiciary, we've handed over in part to an organization that is left of the public, and they have delivered judges back to us that are left of the public as well. The implications of that, the negative implications of that, I think are, are quite obvious. Um, you know, the same thing is true to a lesser extent at the federal level. You know, for a long, long time, the American Bar Association, I'm sure, another one of these councils, um, they had special preview power over federal judges before the president nominated those judges to the Senate. Uh, the ABA got a sneak peek at who those judges would be. They went through their rating process for those judges, and they told the president what the rating was going to be before the president nominated the judge. So the purpose of all that was that if the ABA was going to give the judge a bad rating, the president could decide not to nominate the judge and therefore avoid the embarrassment. Um, you know, this process went on for many, many years. Uh, George W. Bush stopped uh, giving the ABA this preview. Obama put the preview back in. Trump took the preview out. And I understand now, I'm surprised to learn this before I came here today, that Biden, I gather, has continued the Trump policy of not giving the ABA their, their preview. And I think this is all great news because four uh, empiricists have looked at the ABA ratings over the years. And they've tried to control for every variable they could about the judges to discern whether the ABA is rating Republican nominees lower than Democrat nominees. And the three studies that look at Court of Appeals nominees have all concluded the ABA gives worse ratings to equally qualified Republican nominees than they do Democrat nominees. The only study that showed no discrimination against Republicans was the study that lumped district judges in with Court of Appeals judges. There was no bias there. But the Court of Appeals, all the studies agree, bias against Republican nominees. This is predictable. When you have a group 
that is to the left of the Republican Party, to the left of the American people, they're going to look at things differently than we do and the American people do. Now, my friend Daniel here said it's important to keep bar associations involved because what else could preserve judicial independence better than having bar associations involved? Well, I have to just respectfully disagree with him. In all of the states that don't use merit selection and don't have bar associations involved, they still have independent judges. The United States federal judiciary is the most independent in the world. And it was independent before the ABA got involved, and it's been independent after the ABA was dropped uh, as well. So I don't think we need the bar associations picking our judges to ensure that we get judicial independence. Let me transition uh, uh, here now to legal education. We've heard about the role that the council at the ABA has been delegated by the federal government and by state supreme courts. They've been delegated power to accredit the law schools. You have to uh, go to one of these accredited law schools if you want federal financial aid, which of course you have to have federal financial aid because who can afford what we're charging. Uh, and um, so it's a lot of power. This accreditation power is a lot of power. And you know, let me tell you what the ABA is doing with their power, the council of the ABA is doing with their power. They are pushing as strongly as they possibly can what we call diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there's a standard right now that we're already subject to, standard 206, that says we are required to take concrete steps to show a commitment to racial diversity, including racial diversity on the faculty and racial diversity in the student body. And we have to send statistics to the ABA, the council of the ABA, showing how many we have of every racial group. This standard is bad enough, and they're trying to beef it up. Oh, by the way, that standard says that if there's a constitutional or statutory provision otherwise, it's no excuse to not follow the standard, that you still have to do whatever is conceivable under the law to show this commitment to racial diversity, anything in a constitution or a statute otherwise notwithstanding. They're trying to beef this up even further. There's a proposal, there have been many proposals by the council to, to beef this up. They want to make it clear that we're required to include underrepresented minority groups on the faculty. They've got a whole list of these groups, racial groups, uh, gender identity groups, disability groups. We're required to have members of these groups on our faculty under a proposal that has been pending for a while by the council. Faculty is going to be required under this proposal to have DEI education. Every year we're going to be required to be educated on how we can use diversity in the classroom. This is uh, the next step in this ABA power to accredit law schools. There's uh, concern that these uh, beefed up uh, standards won't go far enough to diversify things. So the latest step that's been proposed is to drop the requirement that we use the LSAT in student admissions. And the reason why that's been proposed is because it'll allow us to get even more racial diversity if we don't have the pernicious LSAT score staring us in the face when we admit students. Uh, it's not just um, demographic composition uh, rules that they're pushing uh, from the council. There's also a new standard already adopted, this is not a proposal, that requires us to provide education to every student on bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism. We had to provide this education twice, once at the very beginning of law school, and then once again before the student graduates. Uh, you know, we had to change our curriculum at Vanderbilt to accommodate this requirement. We decided the easiest way to accommodate it, I, I hope it passes muster, is that we required every student now to take a class on equal protection. Uh, you know, you used to be able to get out of law school just by taking Con Law 1, which had the separation of powers and the powers of the three branches, and now you have to take equal protection to make sure that you get your education on bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism. So, again, to me this is very predictable. You have a group 
that's to the left of the American people. They're going to come up with ideas that are to the left of the American people as well. What I don't understand is why the government would want to delegate such awesome power to a group that is so out of step with the rest of us. Thank you very much. There's a lot to digest there, to say the least. Um, and we'll get into, we'll get into uh, giving uh, uh, both Daniel and Bill a chance for rebuttal. But one of the things um, that I wanted to touch on that, um, that Brian mentioned is um, the diversity requirements in law schools. Of course, they are there. Um, I know that it was even around the time I left the law school in 2010, Minnesota, um, it was starting to become a, a bigger part of how, you know, how faculty members and stu were hired and students were admitted. Um, but it goes beyond that, too. So in Minnesota, for example, um, you have a, an elimination of bias requirement that you have to do as part of your CLEs. And I know other, uh, many other states have adopted that requirement as well. Um, so there is certainly a regulatory role for bar associations, and um, I think we've heard some of it today. Now, I'm going to go to, to Daniel first, and I promise I'll go to Bill next for a little bit of rebuttal, but I know that they're anxious to probably uh, 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 talk about their views a little more. Yeah, thank you. This is, I, I hope we do have a great debate about this because there are some very interesting points that my co-panelists raised. Um, I'd like to make three points to start it off. Um, first, I, I actually agree with General Olson that the ABA has taken positions on far too many hot button political issues uh, that are unrelated to the practice of law. Uh, and I agree with him, we could go down the list. There's lots of things that I've actually stood up in the ABA Young Lawyers Division Assembly and opposed for that very reason. Uh, you can go back and look at the minutes of that body if you want proof. Um, but I, I agree with him on that point. The problem, and this could be a panel in and of itself, is drawing that line. What's related to the practice of law and what's not? And I go back to the Hong Kong example because actually that has become a talking point of the Communist Party when they point to the Hong Kong Bar Association and say that when you oppose the implementation of the national security law that we are using to persecute democracy activists, you are engaging in interference with the political questions that are unrelated to the practice of law. Uh, and so we just have to be careful uh, that in, in trying to, 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 to make that point to bar associations, we don't want to hamstring them and prevent them from pr pr providing the separation of powers functions that I outlined. Um, second point, uh, I greatly respect uh, uh, General Olson's point again um, uh, about his opposition to, to lawyers regulating lawyers. And I was at Professor Epstein's talk last night as well. I don't think he was referring to uh, a profession regulating itself. He was talking about a person being a judge in his own case, an individual litigant. That, of course, is not what goes on in bar associations. Um, and I listened carefully uh, to, Professor, or to, to General Olson's comments, and I didn't hear an alternative, right? So, so who is going to do it if not lawyers? And I think the answer to that is, of course, the democratic process, which in almost every other area of economic activity in our society means a bureaucracy in Washington. Um, so let's be careful what we wish for on that. I'd further say that to the extent there is an issue with lawyers regulating lawyers, it is ameliorated to the extent that lawyers understand themselves as part of a profession that is naturally self-regulating. Uh, as a practicing lawyer, I can't tell you the number of times that I'm sitting in my office counseling a client and telling them what the law is, uh, and they go out and act on my advice, and there is no regulatory authority anywhere that's going to question what I have said. Right? There's a professional role there that we are trained for, you know, through law school, through the bar exam, and that lawyers have to inhabit. And it is something different than being a business person, right? We are, we are not able to act just according to the dictates of the market in order to increase our profits. Now, it was an interesting panel this morning with um, two other solicitor generals, uh, uh, Paul Clement and Seth Waxman, and several members of that panel this morning lamented the extent to which the legal profession is moving in the, the direction of becoming just a trade and not a profession. And I, I lament that, that change as well. And actually, I think bar associations are part of the bulwark standing against that. Last point, um, to address uh, Professor Pitch, Fitzpatrick's concerns about the political valence of lawyers. Um, I, I can't dispute that lawyers are more liberal than the public today and that bar associations are more liberal than the public today. The only thing is I would appeal to Burke and the democracy of the dead, right? We need to expand our vision. Uh, the present is not the way it's always going to be. And in fact, if you look back 100 years, bar associations tended to be on the right in society. Uh, they were certainly during the time when a lot of these regulatory powers were put into place. 
Uh, and I think it's fair to say that there will be again. It's an interesting question now as to why lawyers tend to be liberal in our day and age. I think it probably has something to do with the populist movements on the right that have gained prominence in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, lawyers, of course, tend to be on the more elite side of society because it requires additional education and you become a professional. Um, so, so that's where we are now, but I don't think it is always going to be that way, which um, raises an important point, right? When a, when a institution that is designed to be counter-majoritarian in some respects does not reflect the political views of the people that is not a bug, it is a feature. Uh, and, and just to illustrate, I think it's fair to say this the US Supreme Court today is to the right of the median US voter, but we don't therefore abolish its counter-majoritarian aspects. In fact, those are part of the checks and balances of the system that are crucial to preserve. Uh, and so during this era of history, when bar associations and lawyers, yes, are more liberal than the median voter, let's not do away with the institutions that have stood us in good stead for so many decades and that we will need to preserve for when the pendulum swings back the other way. All right, thank you, Bill. Any further comments? So um, in 1879, the ABA established the Standing Committee on Legal Education Admissions to the bar. As Daniel said, I think throughout much of its history, probably the members of the American Bar Association were more to the right of the public. But, and a lot of our standards, you know, you can trace back to some of the standards they passed. I don't think that made them bad. I don't think that made them unrepresentative. I also think that all the professional schools have separate accrediting bodies because it's believed that they're is something about a profession that an accrediting body with expertise in that has some input into it. As I said, the majority of our um, uh, council is not, um, is not composed of legal academics. We don't have an ideological test to be on the council. I told you like how we get there. I also just wanna comment because there is misunderstandings about some of our proposals and about what some of our um, standards require. So yes, we are looking at the diversity standard we have, standard 206, we've withdrawn it and we're still working on it. Yes, people from all side, both sides of the ideological spectrum don't like it. And I think the council's trying to figure out how do you draw a line that works. It was not the intent of the council that everyone has to have, you know, a member of every one of the protected categories in our non-discrimination clause. What 206 does is just say, make an effort to have diversity in your law school. I read incorrectly at times that the council imposes a quota. Well, that's obviously not true. If you look at the diversity of our law schools, they vary from school to school. No one's out of compliance with our standards. No one's been sanctioned for that. The extent to which the council believes that diversity is important is not that different from other accreditors, from other professional accreditors, or even from the state supreme courts and bar examining authorities. As I mentioned at the beginning, our USD Department of Education authority is not really critical to 90% of our law schools because if we decided to withdraw, they would still be able to get student loans because their universities are regionally accredited. I also want to mention that um, on the limits of our, our authority, we only have authority over law school. We don't have authority over the university. So to the extent you want to create a different body, first I would say, think about that. The reason the 50 state Supreme Courts delegate this to the council is if each of them decided what a program of legal education would look like, then people who wanted to practice law might be only be able to practice law in one state or five states or whatever the 50 state Supreme Courts would decide. So they're delegating it to a body I think is important. I don't know the alternative body that would be less political or less ideological. I think the council tries very hard not to be ideological. I do want to also comment on the current standard 303, which I do know is unpopular with a lot of people, and that is provide education on cross-cultural competency, anti-bias, and racism. And I think, you know, also not that inconsistent with what other accreditors want, but all that is saying that we live in a society that segregates itself. More than ever, 
people are isolating themselves to their little informational silos with only people who disagree with them. Maybe if you want to be a professional, you should at least talk about how other people not in your informational silo, not who you grew up with and, and associate with think so that you don't offend them if you're going to represent them or that you, if they're a, a party in front of your court, that you, they will feel that you're fair. You may think their ideas about bias and racism are ridiculous, but I think if you want to represent a person that you need to understand sort of where they come from and be able to get their trust because you don't make assumptions about them that um, are incorrect. So it, the, the, that standard also says we don't dictate the form or the content of it. We accredit conservative law schools and conservative leaning law schools. I assume they'll inf they will implement this differently than a lot of other law schools, and I think that will be okay. It's just have the conversation. Right now, in a lot of law schools, people on the opposite, students on the opposite end of the ideological spectrum don't even want to talk to each other or hear each other. I think encouraging law schools to have the conversation, and once again, we're not requiring a course. The pursuant to the criticism we got, we said you don't have to do a course, it can be a guest lecture, it can be something in orientation, and we don't dictate to you the form or content. Now how the council will enforce it, and if it turns out to go badly, I just want to impress upon you, like General Olson said, I think they're very thoughtful people who, if it goes badly, will we consider it and think about changing it. We amend our standards every year. So um, I don't want to go on because other people need to have a chance right. to talk. Right, and I want to, I want to have a time to get to questions. Maybe I have a question of my own, but I want to give everyone a chance for a brief rebuttal. But uh, we've got about a little more than 20 minutes left. I want to make sure we get to questions. So Ted, do you have anything you, you'd like to, to say? Well, I have a number of things. Okay. But I'm going to. <laughs> Um, I'm going to adhere to what your implicit admonition is to be concise. Thank you. Uh, the last point, um, and I'll make a couple of points, but the last point about cross-cultural competence. The ABA has a hard time defining what that is. It is requiring law schools to include in, its, in their curricula something called cross-cultural competence. Uh, Bill makes a point that, well, maybe that's good to teach people how to understand one another. Maybe it is. Maybe diversity, standing alone, uh, is a compelling governmental interest. Maybe it isn't. But this, who should decide that? Should the law schools decide what they are teaching? Should individual students have an opportunity to be exposed to these things, or shall they be required? And by the way, it's not a choice between 50 state different systems. The accreditation authority is created by and given by the Department of Education, and it's tied to the availability of federal funds and the federal assistance. Now, Bill's right, you could probably go to another place, go to a different university, get a graduate degree, forget about the law degree, and then you don't have to worry about this. But it's a federal requirement. Now, the choice is, I heard, that you could either have this system where we have this private group, the ABA, do this, or you'll have a federal bureaucracy. Well, that is citizen private associations who have interests, and, and as we've just heard, they swing. By the way, they were very, very much on the right in the, in the Eisenhower years and so forth, and now they're very, very much on the left. But that swings back and forth. It's a private group that has its own interests and its own... Uh, it's, it's judging its own cases by developing these standards. Or the federal bureaucracy. I don't like the federal bureaucracy. Bill, I think, was uh, said the, the, you know, the rise in Bar Association regulatory authority in this case came along at the same time as the rise of the regulatory state. And I thought, well, case closed. <laughs> I don't like the regulatory state, and we heard from Professor Epstein the things that are wrong with the regulatory state, not because it's government regulation, 
It's how it is government regulation, how people are selected, how Congress has uh, abdicated its responsibility to delegate specific authority, how it is picked of, of, with re, irrespective of the appointment clause or the removal provisions of the Constitution, so-called experts to do things which are based upon political parties and things like that. So the difference is, uh, you know, it might be lousy to be a federal bureaucracy, but it is at least the government that our Constitution ordains. Um, and so I think, and like I said, I do believe that the members of, of the ABA have good intentions in mind. They think these things that they're promulgating are good for society and good for us all as a culture to learn more about one another and to, and have this and be and behave ourselves better in court and not harass people or not demean people and that sort of thing. But the decisions ultimately come down as far as the ABA is concerned is to the House of Delegates. That's the regulatory authority of the ABA. That means, and I said this before, but I'll, I'll make it brief. <laughs> Um, I said that I said that I would make it brief, and I'm uh, violating that. The 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 selection of the House of Delegates. When I was a, 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 a delegate from the administrative law section, I was voting on the death penalty, uh, abortion, and, and various different social issues. And I kept saying to myself. I'm a member of the administrative law section of the ABA. What do I know about that better than my neighbor that lives across the street? But I got one vote. Um, and then someone from a, a gender orientation group, you know, might get uh, a couple of votes and so forth. And these are all selected willy-nilly. So there's, there's disproportionate. There's no one person, one vote in the ABA as far as the House of Delegates co concerned and no consistency with respect to selection of the House of Delegates. So it is a crazy quilt process um, that leads to this ultimate thing that I will say, finish by saying, this is regulation. It is regulation of legal officers in society. Legal officers in society have great moral authority and legal authority. So it is regulation uh, imposed by the government. But it's imposed by the government. Should it be imposed by the government itself and government officials appointed and developed pursuant to the Constitution? Or should it be private organizations that may swing to the left or may swing to the right, but they have their own self-interest? And I'm saying the bottom line of this is, this is a system that needs to be fixed. All right, Brian. One quick point, and that is, uh, to be fair to Dean Adams, um, I think that a lot of law schools, including Vanderbilt, would probably do all of this DEI stuff even without the ABA. <laughs> uh, at Vanderbilt, we have brought roughly 15 faculty candidates back to campus over the last two years. One out of the 15 has been a white male. I don't think that's because the ABA demanded it. I think that's because we would demand it even without the ABA. But I do worry not so much about the Vanderbilts because we're irredeemably crazy. But <laughs> I do worry about the other law schools, the George Masons, maybe the Notre Dames, maybe the Pepperdines, maybe some state schools where they have a little more sense than we do. I do worry about what's going to happen with them and these ABA standards. Thank you. You might notice that uh, Brian's had tenure for a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, one thing I need to ask, and I'm, I'm going to ask this, and we're going to go straight to questions, but I think it's very important. In the original description of this panel, um, it talked about the First Amendment, and there are serious First Amendment, Amendment issues with bar associations. We didn't talk about that today, and I knew we weren't, no one was going to cover that today, but I want to just ask the question which is when is particularly integrated bar associations take positions that their members disagree with? And I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm stealing anyone's thunder. Um, what do you think? Um, do we have First Amendment problems here? Now, there's a Supreme Court case, and I forget the name of it, from the early 90s, I believe, that sort of suggests that it's not, it's not a First Judge Amendment Strass, problem. It's, Ke it's Keller v. Stay of California. You're literally, my, my name's John Reeves. I'm actually a solo appellate lawyer in St. Louis. You are literally asking the very question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Keller, well, I, I just wanted to make sure we... whether Keller, in light of Janus, which overruled all of Keller's precedent, whether unified bar associations are unconstitutional under the First Amendment now. You got it. 
I will sit down now. Thank no, you that's for, a thank, great thank, question. Thank you. Great I'm, minds. I'm honored, a, I'm honored a federal appellate judge stole my thunder and read my mind. Thank you, Your Honor. Excellent question. Anyone want to take that? And if, so, yeah, Daniel. I'll be very brief. I actually agree that, yes, I think there are First Amendment problems. Uh, and it's actually a different question than the regulatory power bar associations. Because the, the solution to the First Amendment problems could be to do something like what California did, which is to separate into an integrated bar that performs the regulatory functions and a voluntary bar that does advocacy and CLE and mentorship and all the other things bar associations do. I think that's a model that we've now seen uh, implemented. And I think we're going to see it more around the country. And I would actually support that. Anyone else want to take a stab at that one? Well, I will say I, will say, uh, I think it's blatantly unconstitutional, except to the extent that California's attempt, or one state, California, attempted to segregate it so that the dues that you're required to pay to be a part of this association don't go to social programs and things like that. But, the, but the, in practice, the, administer, the way it works in California is not quite that simple. These lines are, as, as someone here on this panel said, you know, it's, it's a little uh, slick, um, and it's, uh, the lines are uh, different. And then it, is, is it uh, uh, money to pay for changing the probate code from 30 days to 45 days, or is it how lawyers behave when they're in court? And there's a, there's a very ambiguous hazy line between the two. And I don't think that is the solution. I think that lawyers shouldn't have to be a part of a trade union. Uh, and if they want to be a part of the ABA, they can be a part of the ABA, or they can be a part of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, which is voluntary. But they shouldn't be required to pay dues for things that they don't support. Okay. Let's go to the back of the room, because uh, I noticed there's some people that have been standing up there for a while, too. Sure. Uh, John Vecchione, New Civil Liberties Alliance. One, uh, I have never thought it was very s strong argument that the bar is either more liberal or more conservative than the population. Um, but I do have one problem, and it, it goes to the question of attorney um, discipline. And I've noticed that the bar in California let Tom Girardi run rampant with uh, with with. Um, client accounts, and I think the most important thing that bar associations have to do is have lawyers not steal from their clients. I think that makes us look the worst you possibly can. And here in D.C., the fella who back, who, who, who uh, changed the, the um, uh, warrant request um, in the Russiagate thing got a slap on the wrist here, like a few months. In Michigan, for some reason, he's out for two years, but here it's very light. And I have never seen, I read the, uh, the police blotter, I get my journal and I read the disciplinary, uh, uh, who's been disciplined, I never see any Justice Department or, or in any government lawyers disciplined. And I'm wondering if the, if the way discipline and the way these bars discipline people isn't now being affected by that makeup. All right, anyone want to take that question about the disciplinary process? I will say it's a very, very good question. It's like a very good point because there's a whole lot of inconsistencies. There's disciplinary action that's triggered because some lawyer or some citizen files a complaint with the disciplinary authority, and then whether you like it or not, whether it's whether it's one kind or another kind or meritorious or not, you have to go through an investigation. You probably have to hire a lawyer to defend yourself and explain. And I have personal examples that I could give, but we don't have time for that. I do think you, you make a very, very good point that that disciplinary power is very powerful, and it does have an interorum effect with respect to lawyers, and sometimes it comes down on the wrong people. Anyone else? Go ahead. One quick Anyone? comment on that. I mean, it, um, I think government lawyers are the subject of ethics complaints, uh, and actually that's an interesting case study to look at the effectiveness of our system of lawyer regulation. So I'm thinking of three prominent examples from the Trump administration where lawyers uh, had ethics complaints brought against them by people on the left uh, for things that they said as part of their political position. So Kellyanne Conway, Jeff Sessions, and Scott Pruitt all were subjects of ethics complaints. All, all three were dismissed by the bar associations that heard them. And I think that actually indicates that our bar associations don't like it when ethics complaints uh, are brought by the political opponents of the lawyer. Uh, and actually, the system is performing rather well in that regard. 
All right, I think it's David Ladd. Are you up, in, up front? Oh, Do I have you right? It's, lights are bright, but do you have a question? Yes. Uh, so my name is David Latt. I write a Substack newsletter called Original Jurisdiction. It is ostensibly about law and the legal profession, but it could also be called about free speech problems at American law schools, e.g. Yale Law School. And so <laughs> my, my question is for Dean Adams. You mentioned very commendably about how we need to come out of our intellectual silos. You also mentioned the council is revisiting its standards every year. Is there currently a standard in the ABA requiring intellectual diversity? And if there is not a standard requiring intellectual diversity, is it something you would consider? So we are, we are looking at our academic freedom standard. I, I would be worried about any regulatory body trying to be ideological police, how we'd categorize it, how we'd enforce it, and how we'd measure it. Um, I do think that it is, I understand the complaint about um, the, the, the ideology of, of law school faculty, back to the professor. The, the standard that I said has drawn a lot of criticism was proposed to us by 140 law deans, and I said to them, if you all want to do it, why do you need a regulation? And, you know, <laughs> so um, it is question, you know, I guess you can question why we went ahead and did it, I, although like, I, think, I think the intent of the, of the council is good. I think, I think any regulatory body that tried to become ideological police would probably do it badly. Um, <laughs> I think us continuing to, to accredit conservative law schools, conservative leaning law schools, if we expand our ability for people to go to online, then those who are geographically bound can make their choices accordingly. I think th there are some times when I think we need to not be paternalistic and we'd probably do more harm if we went that direction. And so that, that would be my concern. I think it would probably not could not, and, and, and I, I, I think the council's a great group of people. I think any regulator trying to do that, the enforcement issues would be such that you don't want to ask them to do that. Just a two second follow up. Um, with, you have DEI training. Is there a free speech training requirement or a First Amendment, tra First Amendment <laughs> training requirement? So, I mean, you can always suggest to the council. Um, to add those sort of things. I will say this one is, has been different from the direction the council's been trying to go, which is to be less paternalistic and to let the sort of marketplace do that. And I, I understand there's still a lot of standards that, that need to, to be rethought that way. Some of them though are required by the US Department of Education. So um, I know this one goes in the opposite direction. I, if you look, at any university and you go into the various schools, you will see we provide more consumer information to people who want to go to law school than any other part of the school. It'll tell you like what your chances of getting in, what your chances of getting a scholarship. It does talk about the diversity of the faculty and the student body. It also will tell you uh, what your job prospects are from that school, how the employment outcomes are. And I think we have been trying to do more consumer information so that maybe we can be less paternalistic and maybe we're not doing that perfectly, but I do think the council is trying to go that direction. Well, and I wanted to ask, Brian, do you have anything to add? I know this is sort of in your bailiwick and if you have a brief comment well, on I it. Well, I just wanted to say this. You know, I don't doubt that it would be very difficult to draft and enforce a standard that requires a commitment to ideological diversity but it's also very difficult to draft and enforce a standard that requires a commitment to racial diversity. Who's a part of which race? How do we know? Um, I think we're in difficult enforcement land either way, and if we're gonna do it for race, then I would like to see us do it for other types of diversity as well. Okay, let's go to the back of the room. I think it may be Lee Otis back there, but correct me if I'm wrong. It is, thank you very much, uh, Judge Strauss. Um, this is, I think, a good follow-up in some ways to David's question. Um, I think that part of the problem is that if you have a diversity, equity, and inclusion standard, it actually puts a thumb on the scale against academic freedom in a number of different contexts and also against free speech in a number of contexts. For example, um, let's say that somebody wants to do 
research, you know, into uh, whether um, having uh, more police, you know, is helpful or harmful to minorities. Um, that person is going to be very worried about being the subject of, you know, a diversity, equity, and inclusion complaint. Um, and and you have, uh, you know, you know, and, and let's say that someone says something, you know, that is potentially controversial, but that has you know, a pretty good pedagogical basis for it um, on the teaching side. Um, again, that person's going to be subject to a diversity, equity, and inclusion complaint. Um, and so when you require the one, uh, you're, you're really putting a thumb on the scale in many ways, uh, you know, especially because of the way that diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracies are composed. You're really putting a thumb on the scale of, uh, anti-free speech and anti-academic freedom. So I think that's part of the impetus for, you know, wanting something on the other side. Now it may be that the wrong, that's the wrong answer and the right answer is to get rid of the diversity, equity, and inclusion standard. But I think that's what's creating the, the, the problem or the, the issue. Um, what are your thoughts? So a lot done back there, but sort of a follow up to, to David Latt's question there. Anyone want to take that one? Well, I can give an example of a um, situation where we had a DEI complaint at Vanderbilt. One of my colleagues um, was brought into the DEI office after a student complained because the professor, my colleague, allowed another student in the class to quote from a United States Supreme Court decision from 1957 that was in the casebook, the student quoted a sentence from that case that included the word Negro. Um, and my colleague didn't say anything about it. And so the DEI office got involved and the DEI office gave my colleague a statement to read to the class anytime a student ever quoted that word again. Um, now, I don't want to blame the ABA for that, because again, at Vanderbilt, we'd probably do it without the ABA. But there is a real danger that you know, inclusion can be construed to um, censor uh, certain discussions that faculty and students might otherwise want to have. Bill also wanted to, to follow up on this quickly. So I'm glad you said that that action would not have been required by any of our diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion things. And that is the reason we had the roundtable on academic freedom to talk about briefing that up to making it more clear that we do not want people being inappropriately censored. I'll also say that, you know, because people do talk to me about should complaints be filed with us, um, as I tell people, one, we don't resolve, if you believe you've been discriminated against, we don't resolve individual complaints. Questions. We're not the agency the to come talk to. If the, if the school has a policy or practice, so we'll look at three it. Three also, we don't second guess generally um, schools' decisions about about employment decisions, you know, whether to, you know, there were people who would like for us to, you know, order professors to be fired, and I say we don't do that. And, and we also don't, you know, second guess your, your uh, um, disciplinary um, decisions as well. And so trying to sort of balance these things, like I say, I'm not sure that we have it perfectly done yet. We're still working on that, but we would not, require whatever happened to that Vanderbilt professor. That's not a requirement of our standards. All right. We don't have, really have time for any more questions, but Daniel, did you want to say something well, very briefly? I think Bill said it all, basically. But we are looking at that question, and it's something that's important. So uh, get involved in the process. I mean, submit a comment, participate in our next roundtable. I'll okay. that invitation. So I have to keep the trains running on time. That's the one thing that they told me I had to do. And I will say that they ate a little into our time with the, uh, with the drawing, but I, I thought the panel did a great job uh, with the limited time we had. So thank you. Very important.